Welsh History Podcast. My name is Jonathan, and this is episode 19, End of Welsh Resistance. Boudicca Rebellion died in some unknown hilly area west of London. The damage it caused the British people would be evident quickly thereafter. Noted Roman Britain historian Peter Salway describes that sites were abandoned and replaced. From Iron Age roundhouses to villas, they had become generally fairly wealthy places. But within short order, so within the 20 years of settlement, by the end of that period, these roundhouses, now villas, were ended up, were either destroyed or in some cases were replaced by huts and much poorer people. A lot of the workers and warriors of the Aysenae and other tribes were likely taken as slaves. The British would be poor for their efforts. That's the problem when you face the Romans, is if you can't beat them, what ends up happening typically is you become subject to their mercy, and they don't have a lot usually when you rebel against them. Uh, The Jews in Judea would know a little bit about this shortly after this particular revolt happened. It is not uncommon for this to be the case, but the need for recovery time and the bitterness must have been palpable amongst the British population. And because of this, Roman governors after Boudicca would take a very different tactic from for those who are under Roman domination. They apparently received a somewhat softer treatment. Likely this meant less harsh terms, more respect of land, and less pushing of Roman values on society. Time and commerce would do what military might could not, win the hearts and minds of the people. In Rome, the Julio-Claudians came to a sticky end with the death of Nero, and the year of the four emperors took up time and soldiers from Britain. Legions were being called back to deal with the fallout of various campaigns and supporting various candidates for emperor. Uh, In the case of the 14th Legion, for example, they end up having to take their tail between their legs and run back to Britain after they supported the wrong guy in the battle with the uh, eventual winner. In the end, that winner was former legionary commander in Britain, Flavius Vespasian, who won the empire, and with him, the Roman chaos ended. In Wales, however, not much has really changed. Romans are still not wanted, and the tribes there are mostly still holding out. The Silures had been revolting for about 20 years off and on, and the Roman Britain being under new management may have received a light hand, but these post boudican managers, the new uh, people in charge were much more proactive, you might say, to use a modern term. To be blunt, they would brook no more holdouts. All must fall under Pax Romana or die. And the first more active governor was Quintus Patilius Serelius, who was the head of the Ninth Legion, which was broken in the fighting with Boudicca, so he might have either had a lot of respect for the Britons or hated them for killing his men. Possibly both. In fact, as it turns out, Cerulius and his cavalry are the only survivors in the fight with Boudicca. But they reform and are sent to Germany and are very experienced warriors when they come back to Britain later on. And they are given responsibility of the highest order as sort of the lead forces. He ends up taking the Ninth Legion and finally defeating the somewhat troublesome client kingdom of the Brigantes and brought them fully under Roman control, defeating the last major British tribe free in England. That battle kicks off over, once again, the husbands of uh, Queen Cardamandua, who we've spoken a lot about during this podcast. But in this particular case, whatever had happened between Cardamandua and her various husbands, it appears that Cardamandua finally lost, and it was up to the Romans to finally take it back. Uh, And at this, Aurelius is sort of in charge of of starting that process, and eventually he will capture the what is now called the city of York, and he will set up a fort there that begins the settlement of that community as a Roman territory, and like I said, will eventually destroy that kingdom as a separate kingdom, and will put an end to British control of what is now called England. 
even though he was able to achieve this at the end of his three-year term, Cerulius was taken out of positional leadership in Britain, no longer the governor. A new governor was on the scene, again, familiar with the area, having served in the military in Britain, both during the initial Claudian invasion and later on as a military commander during the governorship of Cerulius. It is Sextus Julius Frontinius. Now, Frontinius is a a fairly famous person because he wrote a number of different uh, books, one of which is on military strategy tactics, uh, how to treat your your soldiers, how to deal with malcontents, how to deal with problems of rebellion in your military. And he was actually a fairly highly respected classical author of this kind of military, sort of the, the Western version of Sun Tzu for a lot of people and was actually highly read into the Middle Ages, and thus part of the reason why we actually have copies of his writings. He also is very famous for having set up aqueducts in Rome and helping to make that city kind of have its own water supply, and and he was instrumental in actually fixing up a lot of what was wrong with the uh, supply of water and fresh water in specific to uh, Rome. So this is a guy who knew how to fight, and had a very uh, administrative mind. He knew a lot about a lot of things. He knew how to coordinate things. He knew how to take command, how to set up and control. And so you know that he's probably pretty clever, pretty able, probably the best leader in the country at the time, and probably the one person who can deal best with the Welsh tribes. Because up to this point, they haven't been beaten. I mean, they've beaten... The Deca Angli, they probably put the Ordovice to heel on a couple of occasions with Caractacus. But the reality of it is, is the Silures were still a nuisance. The Ordovice were still being a nuisance. There were still problems going on in Wales, even after the defeat of their Druids, and even after the defeat of Boudicca, who likely the Welsh tribes helped. Now they're on their own. And they're facing the might of the Second Legion, who has been tasked with bringing the Silures finally to heel. And Frontinus is considered such an able commander that he is sent in to kind of do this. And while we don't have a lot of information about this situation, unfortunately, this is where the gap in the historical record fails us. Because we do know some things from archaeology. We know one line, unfortunately, from Tacitus, likely because Tacitus' annals carried much more information, but we lost the bits of it that covered this. It's so disappointing to see that, you know, at key points in the in the Roman British history, we just lose our best source for all of this. And so in this case, we lost Tacitus. So all we have is one line, and this is basically what he says. He says, but Julius Frontinus was a great man, so far as humanly possible, sustained the burden cast on him, his arms reduced to Silures, a powerful warlike race. He surmounted not only the valor of the enemy, but also the physical difficulties of the land. So in other words, Tacitus again pointing out his, it almost sounds like love, but that might be the wrong word, for the uh, diligence for the difficulty of this particular group, at least as an opposition to what he could seize as the corruption of Roman rule under the emperors. And of course... The Flavians end up falling into being bad emperors under Domitian. And so Tacitus never likes Domitian. He writes very poorly about him. Obviously saw him as a tyrant. And thus, he has a tendency to compare everybody else unfavorably compared to, you know, someone who's willing to stand up to the might of Rome. Because, of course, Rome is so great in his eyes, you know, obviously it will never be defeated. But the reality of it is, is this group is actually a worthy adversary, I guess is the way to put it. So he sees the Silures as being great. And so what ends up happening is, is you end up with this situation where you have Frontinus using his skills as a military commander to finally put paid to the Silures. He finally finishes off their might their military prowess, but I think most of all, and I think, again, Tacitus is making this point, their ability to do things that the Romans aren't comfortable doing. In other words, 
Romans are not ones to go fight guerrilla wars. They will eventually adapt to this and kind of fight their own guerrilla war against people. But for the most part, that's not what they do. Their, their goal is, is to fight you, you know, man to man, their organization and their tactics beating your disorganization and your chaos. But the reality of it is in this situation is that the Silurians were really on borrowed time as it was. They were a tribe, but they're a small, you know, relatively small tribe in a small part of Britain. And largely, it was only a matter of time before the Romans could beat them. And the reality of it is the Romans were never going to brook any sort of major resistance. And especially if it meant it was going to harm or hurt them or put them in a situation where they might actually need to stop these guys. And so it was going to come down to them defeating them at some stage. But nonetheless, the Silurians held out for a long time and did it mostly with just a bit of help and just a bit of success. You know, the, the Romans obviously don't write a lot about other people's successes against them, but you can tell from the way they give them respect. They must have had a lot of success against the Romans. And the fact that they were defeated doesn't mean that they were bad at fighting the Romans, but just that the reality of it was is the overwhelming numbers and the ability of the Romans to adapt to every situation that becomes them, at least in this stage of empire, makes it difficult for anybody to sort of stand against them. And that's basically what happens here. They have too many resources, too much ability to ship troops very quickly using Roman roads. They have an ability to hold formations, to fight strategically. They have cavalry, which they can send into areas to to kind of roust you, um, as well as land forces that, that are pretty dang hard to beat up front. I mean, when you fight them one-on-one, -on -one, a Roman is going to be hard to fight. Their way of fighting is such that they're very difficult to break, and unless you either have superior numbers or better tactics or better terrain, or in preferably all three, you're going to have a hard time beating them. And the Silurians had at least one, possibly two of these, but couldn't get the third because they just didn't have more men. And the reality of it is once the fighting over who was emperor was over, and the Flavians took over, uh, you ended up having this situation where tactically they couldn't hold on much longer, and so they were defeated. Interestingly, though, that didn't mean that the Romans just turned their back and ignored them. They actually made sure that they stayed beaten. Um, what they ended up doing was putting a legionary fort in the, probably, I would assume, in the market town. That was probably the the either the hill fort or the general location of their village that would have been sort of the central hub of the village, you know, where the palace might be if there was a king. And they plopped it down there and then put smaller auxiliary forts around to kind of maintain that peace that they have. And then they built a ton of roads. All across Wales, they build a ton of roads. They put in little auxiliary forts along the way, little sentinel bases. Uh, in South Wales, in fact, we see these. There's one at Cardiff. Uh, there's one at uh, Carmarthen. There will be one at uh, Carwent. We'll have uh, what we call a civitas. But also there's the main one, which is the one where the Second Augustan Legion was based. This place is called now Carleon, or the Roman Fort. And it's based on, or Roman legionary fort, I should say, and was even in the time of Gildas, 500 years later, was still called the city of the Roman legion. So there was a lot of remembrance about this idea that that was where the legion ended up. And so it became famous for that name and, and still to this day holds that name. And having been to Carleon, let me tell you, I, I recommend anybody who wants to see some of Roman Britain's greatest evidences and some of its interesting sites, Carleon's definitely one to go see because they have the legionary base there. You can kind of walk around what's left of it. It's not, you know, we're not talking about massive ruins. These are basically what they found in the ground after the fact and typically what happens in these cases. And you find this across Britain at any time and age is when 
things start to decay or fall apart or fall into disuse, people take from it and they rebuild something new. So in the case of this massive legionary base, which had been so formalized, it had gone from being a wood affair to being an actual stone affair. They actually robbed all the stone, so all you have is about a foot of stone now. And maybe not even that in some places. And you can wander around and you can step into these little domiciles of the various legionaries and they're very small little places and there's other things set up there of course in Carleon you also have the amphitheater there that they built up which I think is really fascinating to go into it 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 is been grassed over so it looks a little different than it would have in the Roman days it's not exactly like the Flavian amphitheater which we better know as the Colosseum uh, also there is a a a very nice center where you can see like the Roman bath that they had there and they talk about some of the evidences they had as well if you go to Cardiff and you go to the Cardiff castle which had been built by the Romans one of the things you can find if you walk into the walls there's a, a little area where they kind of show things around and one of the things that they show is the fact that the original walls that were built by the Romans are still there and still a part of the castle grounds which I think is fascinating so even after the Normans came and built their keep and built walls around the keep, even after the Victorians got a hold of it and created their own folly, there's still this evidence of the Roman settlements in these areas, which I think is just fascinating. And of course, uh, one of the other places that they sent up is a place called uh, Diva Victrix. This is refers to the 20th Legion. That was set up in actually uh, Chester. And that's the other thing. Once Wales finally falls in large part to the Romans, one of the things that happens is they immediately base two legions there. So you can tell they didn't trust them enough to let this go. And even though slurries are defeated, they're still the Ordovice to deal with. And Agricola, who we will talk in way more detail about next couple of episodes, ends up going in there and he takes on the Ordovice, probably finishes up what was already started by Fontanus, and likely that is the end of Welsh resistance on the whole. There may be banditry that goes on, there may be piracy that goes on, there might be, you know, a bit of raiding here and there, there's probably, like I said, problems if you go into the mountains by yourself, but the reality of it is, is a large part of the resistance is done. And the Romans will then take that and carry forward after this, and they will build massive structures across the land of Wales. They won't build tons and tons of forts. They have a couple of forts that they build for their legions. Uh, as I said, there's three main areas that they build up in that respect. Then they turn around and they build these auxiliary forts like Saguntinum uh, in Carnarvon and Moradinum in what was now present-day Camarthen, uh, these smaller forts are also found in other places. In fact, there's even smaller forts than those. If you were to go to uh, Castelcock in Cardiff, for example, it was actually built originally. The original keep was built upon an old Roman lookout post, and, and there's because of the river Taff flows in through that way, so that's a good watch point for stuff coming in and out of the valleys. So you have those kind of things all over the place. And of course, you will have Roman roads going everywhere. But the infrastructure projects that are built in from a Roman perspective in Wales in the first and second centuries are generally based around the coasts. They're not interior stuff. There isn't a lot of interior stuff built. And in fact, some of it won't even be built on the coast. It, it turns out that uh, places like uh, the Thlin Peninsula do not even get a single Roman infrastructure project done to them, which says something there, and I'm not entirely sure what, because we don't have a lot of information, but it does make you wonder, I guess, one, did they not figure there was anything particularly of value there? Two, did they understand, or was there a case of the group that was there wasn't worth working with their culture to try and turn them over into Roman Britons? Or, you know, what was the deal with that area that it kind of got left alone, but left alone in a way that left it back in its Iron Age existence? Because those people didn't change into Roman square houses. They stayed largely in roundhouses. Those areas remained very Iron Age in culture. 
And in fact, there's evidence that there was never really any Roman coins even found there. And we'll get a bit more into the monetary stuff in the next episode. But it's fascinating to see that some parts of Wales just remain more or less untouched. And they live on in this sort of proto-state of Iron Age Britain, even past the Roman settlement, and don't largely change over the 400 years that the Romans are there. And by the time the Romans are gone, and even as Romano-Britain continues on, these people are still basically the Iron Age Britons we know from before. And this is where, when I say there's evidence, you know, why did roundhouses get rebuilt after the Romans left? Why did some of the old ideas kick around? Well, this is part of the reason. Because Romans didn't take over every single space in Britain. They didn't dominate the entire country the way a modern society would. They still left pockets of, if not resistance, then basically not worth havings. And you do wonder if that's kind of what happened here, that it wasn't worth their time an effort to do much more than maybe go there periodically. I mean, before modern times, there wasn't a lot of mining in that area. There wasn't a lot of thought that there was value to be had in the mountain ranges there. And it's really almost an afterthought to an extent. And it's not until sort of the monks move out in that direction that we kind of get a change in the way people think about that area. Nonetheless, with all that in mind, we now know that the Romans are taking over. They start to set up their civitas in Roman Wales. They start this. There's only two, though, that are mainly there. Uh, one is in Carwent, and the other one in uh, Camarthen. And these two locations uh, remain. The area that we now call Caerleon is called Issaca Augusta, um, which refers, of course, to the legion that was there, which was the Augustan, Second Augustan Legion. The basic area of Roman domination continues to grow. It continues to pacify the country. And this is the other thing that we'll see is that resistance dies down to the point where Wales kind of falls off the map again. And this is going to be a continual problem along the way. We're going to be talking a lot of Roman Britain still because there isn't a Roman Wales. <laughs> and and Wales isn't separate enough outside of this day-to-day -day thing for this 50 years to actually take and say, oh yeah, here's a Roman Welshman who did this and a Roman Welshman who did that. So we're still going to be talking about Roman Britain for quite some time. But as we move on, we will see more of a Welsh area come to the fore. And then we'll move into the medieval period where, of course, there is a Welsh area and there is Welsh tribes becoming Welsh kings and queens and princes and princesses and major nobility exists. But for now, while we're in Rome, we're still dealing with this fallout of Roman Britain versus Roman Wales. And it's still Roman Britain and not really Roman Wales. Next week, we'll talk more about trade and wealth and Roman coinage and kind of the evidence that has been found. And there's some fascinating evidence regarding all that. We'll talk a little bit about how Wales and surrounding areas become acculturated to the Roman way of life. And we'll begin to delve into the second century, finally, where things have gone from a state of being British to being Romano-British and how that affects the way people think and how from there on in, everything changes. So until the next time, thank you everyone. Uh, you can always get a hold of me on Twitter at John DMP. If you want to contact me for any reason, you can also email me at uh, welshhistorypodcast at gmail.com. Thanks everybody. I hope you have a great day and take care. Bye-bye. This has been a Distractions Media production. For more information, you can check out everything we do at distractionsmedia.com.